Oh, this is not working. Let's pray. Mother of exiles, shelter of the homeless. Oh, you can't hear me? Uh, it's off and on. Mother of exiles, shelter of the home. Okay. So what does that mean? Um, I think we just, you just keep going and... Um, okay. Yeah, all right. Now. Okay. Mother of exiles, shelter of the homeless, we are in need of your mercy. We ask your blessing on your children everywhere who are in danger today. Bless all who suffer from injustice. Shelter them in the warmth of your love and safeguard them from the evil that rages around them. Turn our eyes and hearts to their needs and give us courage to act for their good. We ask this relying on your compassion and confident of your love. Amen. 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 So we are so pleased today to have uh, our good friend, Deacon Emma Rosara Nordlum here to share with us a bit of what's going on in the Latino and Hispanic community of the church around um, doing anti-racism work and uh, also trying to, to um, work toward um, the goals that our presiding bishop have, have and the presiding officers have put forth for us mm -hmm. uh, in becoming the Jesus movement and the Episcopal arm of the Jesus movement. Right. So, um, as I said, really pleased to have Emma here who's been doing so much work around the church Right. with uh, Latino Ministries to mm -hmm. share with us a bit of, of uh, her experience and what she's doing. Right. So, Emma, take it away. Yeah, thank you and buenas noches to everybody who's there. Um, yeah, uh, if, I think if you saw the abstract, uh, I was saying that, and I, I'm sure you all know it, that our Latino communities that come to this country to live, uh, they really face a lot of challenges uh, at all levels, at all levels. And you know, you know, in the process of establishing themselves, adapt uh, to the American society. And one of the major challenges is uh, to face and address issues of race and prejudice, not only among us as Latinos, but also other cultures that they can work with or that they that they meet along the way. So what I'm gonna show you is the work that I've been doing lately, because I've been part of the anti-racism team of the diocese for a long time. And my participation was very small in those teams because we were mainly, um, dealing with race issues between black and white uh, uh, cultures, you know? But, and sometimes I mention, and these are all the other Latinos, but this, what I've been doing in the last year and a half is preparing uh, Latino communities to really work on those, um, learn and about their history and work on those issues through, as James said, through the beloved community framework. So what you see in the first slide here is Canuga, is the Nuevo Amanecer, which is the biennial gathering of Latinos uh, from all over the US. And some of the province nine people come. Also some Americans too that work with Latinos, but two years ago we had close to 500 people attend Canuga. And that, this is a biennial where we get to know each other, we learn, uh, you know, there are lots of presentations that are useful. For example, um, two years ago, we had the first undocumented people go there and talk about DACA and about the rights as undocumented Latinos. 
So in the second slide, what I'm so these are us. These are us, and you see all the colors and all. So this is interesting that I always teach, which is that um, the United States is the second largest Latino country in the world. And people sometimes are like, what? How come? Because we have 50.5 million uh, in the last census. So in two years, it's gonna be more and more and more, and eventually will be the, the, the biggest population in the United States. So, but look at it. In Mexico, we have 112 million, and in Spain, which is the so-called mother country, is 47 million. So that's an interesting slide to look into uh, when, when you want to think about Latinos and how many of us are here. In the next slide, we have the population growth. Uh, you see, in 1980, it was the Southwest, right? Um, and look at the province one, you don't see that many uh, people living there, more in Florida, right? And then we, this is 1980. So now we are going to 1990, um, right? 1990, you see, it becomes, the blue becomes more extensive. Uh, even in the southwest of the United States. And in province, you see Massachusetts, you see Connecticut, you see more. The next one will be uh, 2000, right? Yeah, in 2000, you see even bigger. And then the last one is um, the, the last census. Look at the census, look at it. I mean, Latinos are living everywhere everywhere in this country and you see the dark uh, blue in in all those states new york uh, massachusetts and we have some population data that we're going to give you so another thing that is interesting is to see um number seven wait, wait, james you see the difference. I want you to see between the, in, in those years, look, look at the difference in the, in, in, in the amount of Latinos that have come to live here. And um, we can also, we, I've seen maps of undocumented uh, Latinos and you know, it's huge, the amount. Okay, so now the other slide is something that I always also point out because is how young uh, Hispanics are living in this country, the population. Look, 17.6% of, of, the, of the population, Latino population is between the years of five and 14. Uh, 25 and 34, 17, which are the, the, the uh, how you call that, the uh, young adults, right? And so when, when we think about planting new Latino ministries, uh, inviting more, then we have to think of the ages. We are a young population living, there is a young Latino population living here. We are young people. You know, and also in our countries, you know, we are young. So now the next one. Um, this is important to know. Mexican, uh, the, the Hispanic population here is um, mainly two thirds of the US Hispanic population is of Mexican origin. So 33.5 million. Then comes Puerto Ricans, then Salvadorians, then Cubans, Dominicans, and then the other Hispanic of all the other nations. But as you saw in the map, it's mainly Mexican Americans, which they call themselves also Chicanos, Tex-Mex, Texan, you know, there's all kinds of identities in that area. So and, I know one of the things that I, I found that's, that was extremely interesting that I wasn't really aware of until I went to um, a conference uh, a couple of years ago now, um, the, the new, um, new community. New community. 
you know, there is a, a real difference between Latino and Hispanic. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder if you'd just say a few <laughs> words about that. Is this, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, we keep switching. We usually use it both so that to please people because some people, when, when, they, when there are Brazilians next to us and we call ourselves Latinos, they say, but we are also Latinos. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some people don't like Hispanic because of our history with Spain mm -hmm. and we don't want to be still under whatever they they chose for us. So usually what we do is Latino Hispanic ministries. Uh, but it's the same thing. I mean, it's, there's no, we, it's us, it's us. In different ways of calling each other. Like, like in Texas, like Mexican Americans also can, they say, I'm not a Mexican American. I am a, a Chicano and Chicano is a more political name that they give to themselves. Or no, 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 I am Tex-Mex or I am Texan, or I am Mexican. So it's all kinds of changes, right? All kinds of identities, I call them, because they, they name themselves. I, I believe that, I mean, not that I wouldn't believe it, but what I'm saying is it reminds me of, as an African-American, you know, we're black, we, you know, there are different names, some of them, you know, uh, some of them illustrate a changing consciousness. Yeah. Or where you are regionally, mm -hmm. and so, you know, one shoe doesn't fit all. Right. <laughs> and, right. and I think part of that also is that it, that there are different cultures. There are different and cultures. And we, we need are to talking about, and that's why the work of racial rec reconciliation and the work of erasing prejudice and isms is mm -hmm. so hard because we're dealing with 25, 21 countries and many regions within the same country with all kinds of prejudice and isms within them. So it's really interesting. Yeah, good. Uh, Thank okay. You. So the next slide is about uh, province one, because this is a conference about province one. And you see the percentage of the population uh, of those seven, um, those seven uh, states, right? So uh, the biggest one is Rhode Island, and then comes Massachusetts, and, and then no, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and then the other ones who have smaller populations. And um, so if, if we're gonna work for uh, province one doing anti-racism work, then we have to do it um, in, in those areas and find out, uh, as I did for, for Massachusetts, the division of, of, of the nationalities in each one and see how to do it, right? Another one, 11. So, um, so here, for example, I could find the ma maps, a map like that for the, for the other states, but this is Massachusetts and and, and the blue are the Hispanic. So in, in, with a map like this, you, you can tell where the concentration of Latino population or Hispanic population are, right? So it's interesting. And then they also have Asian and they have uh, non-Hispanic uh, populations, different ones. American Indian, Alaska Native, and other Pacific Islanders, America, well, everything. Okay, so this is for us to know now so that we place ourselves. But now I'm gonna begin with the, with the work that I did in um, province nine. When I went there, um, I did it for two days in a row and, as, and there were 28 women and they decided to gather as women and there were six countries, women from six different countries and province nine is the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, uh, Honduras, Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador. Ecuador has two dioceses, so there were seven, seven dioceses represented. Each diocese sent three women, uh, and they were also, because we were in Panama, so there were Panamanians there too. 
Uh, and the way that I always dreamt about doing the work of erasing prejudice and isms uh, and reconcile was by, me. first of all, like a month before I went, I asked everybody who was going to participate in this two days conference to revisit, review their own history from the conquest to the slavery to the colonial times so that they would come, you know, with an idea and they remembering what had happened so that they would able to, to work and also to give myself, to give them more time to gather at the beginning and and get to know each other because if we don't know each other if we don't ha if we don't if we don't know who you are your name or if you don't do exercises so that people relate a little bit at the beginning then talking about these issues is going to be hard we have to connect somehow so 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 then so then i went through what do you remember? What do you remember of how was the conquest in the different countries? And they, they participated a lot because they really came prepared with what happened. And then we would, I would have in the slides, the re, you know, what really happened in, in, in those moments in that encounter be, between Christopher Columbus and, and the indigenous population. And, and then we came to the conclusion that, yes, they came as conquerors, and then they, 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 it was a, a, a conquest that had two ideas, one, the sword, and the other one with the cross, because, and the one with the cross came later because the Pope, there was a Pope in Rome that had to make a decision whether we, the indigenous people, had a soul. And when they decided that we had a soul, then they they say, no, no, they have to be Christianized. They have to, you know, be baptized. And and then all those um all those um um uh, how you call those orders, religious orders, starting to fight and making agreements of where they would go. So so all that was covered in, in, in that day. Can, you, can I see the other one? So, so then we talked about, you know, what was this conquest? What involved imposing a language, destroying religions, uh, you know, thinking of, wow, when they saw the gold and, and, and the silver going after, and okay, and, and, and really consider us inferior. They were the conquerors anyway. And this, and then we talked about slavery, and then we have to remember that the Spaniards also made slaves out of the indigenous population. It wasn't only the Africans, but at the beginning, they were the indigenous population. Why did they bring um, slaves, black slaves, from, from, from Africa and other places? Because this indigenous population got very ill and died and, and they needed, uh, you know, the work hands to start all the exploitation of the lands. And, they, and then I, I taught them about all the, you know, how the Spaniards would take over lands, name them, and then uh, give them as favors to others uh, so that they could stay or they could they could elevate themselves as titles um, and have titles, different titles. So it was an interesting um, story that they knew. Some of them had brought other stories of different countries. So we all put it together. And uh, can I see the other one? The slave, they, it was interesting to see the map of how the, how, um, Slavery wasn't something new in Europe and, and in, in, the, in this world. Uh, and then they saw how there was a lot of movement of the slaves from all kinds of countries. And then, uh, and, well, and then we talked about the, the, the triangle 
uh, um, you know, the famous triangle of a slave where uh, they will bring something and take something else. Bring the slaves and then take whatever they were doing, uh, gold, silver, uh, cotton, sugar at the end. So that was also cover. Um, everything, I must say that the important thing about this presentation is that it is totally interactive and it's also done in such a way that we are sitting in, in a circle and that I am sitting down so that the power is the same. They, I'm not the expert. We are all the expert. We all listen and then we take our turns um, and then we talk and, and, and discuss and uh, that way that way um, it was done in an in a incredible interactive uh, way. So the next one is, you know, they were very surprised to see the, uh, the boat. Can we continue the other one? This is a boat where the Africans were brought. And then one thing that, that is very important for them to know, and this all is going to be done here when we do this work for Latinos living here because we have the same history, right? Uh, so, and then the next one is one that they were so surprised because the Spaniards created what is called castas, which is names for the mixture because the only, the, the, the blue, I mean, the clean kind of like black was the Spaniard, the white, right? And then the indigenous and the black and anything else was a mixture. And the names that they gave to those mixtures was awful, like albino, salta atrás, coyote, uh, uh, chamiso, cambujo. Even the words are horrible sounding. So, we, and then they also make pictures of those mixtures. But basically, the, the big mixtures were the Spaniard with the indigenous, which is a mestizo, which is us, we are mestizos. And, and the Indian with the black woman is a sambo and they are communities of sambos in the coasts, right? Uh, and then the black and the samba, sambo, uh, sambo. And, but then we have blacks and Spaniards and that's the mulatto. So the main populations are mestizo, mulatto, and sambo. And the other ones, we don't even know. <laughs> they are not named. We are just mestizos, right? But they made it and they made pictures of it. You can see in the, in the 17, the one. Yeah, look at the pictures. They made the pictures to show, you know, the mixtures of, of the cast, whatever they decided. So can I see the other one, the 18? So um, we can say that Latin America is one of the most ethnic, ethnically and racially diverse regions in the world. I mean, we are mixed. And we have our own specific history of slavery because some people have more than others. Colonization, because there were centers three big centers, virreinatos, where the colonial system established itself very strongly, and migration, right, that creates different racial makeups, tension and systems of oppression. That is, is true about us. Uh, so can I see the other one? You can tell me when, okay. Look at this, this is beautiful. These are the indigenous cultures before uh, the, the, the conquest, you see? So we have all these uh, groups of indigenous people living in, in, in Latin America. Uh, beautiful uh, indigenous people. Can I, can I see another one? Can you keep going? These are the Spanish possessions, the Virreinatos, as I say, the three most important ones in, eight, in 1800s. So we have Nueva Granada, we have 
El Rio de la Plata, Perú, and then we have Nueva España, which included Mexico and Central America. Uh, another one. So these are different maps. Uh, these are the, this is the population, the indigenous population in all the countries, in the countries where there's indigenous population. So these are 1,500,000, okay? So there are still indigenous population um, and some of them, for example, in my country, we have in lots of tribes uh, that speak their own language. They also speak Spanish, obviously, but then sometimes the Colombian government allows the, to have their own systems, their own laws, that sometimes, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But uh, that happens. Look at Ecuador. Ecuador has 33.9. Look at Guatemala, 59.7. Uh, Peru, uh, Mexico still has 7 million point five. This percentage, you know, yeah. So what else? This, this is another map of the Pueblos Indígenas de Mexico. You see, it's beautiful. Um, and I put this map here because in, we're going to study when, 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 when we do our work here that, and also it's good for, um, people who want to plant or people who want to, uh, invite Latinos to be part of the Episcopal Church, that sometimes, for example, in California, there are entire groups of these indigenous pueblos that have migrated and they live together and obviously they are the ones who work on on on, on picking you know all the harvest but they 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 don't speak spanish they speak their own language uh and, it's, and you find a lot of them living in in um, in California, in California. So uh, another map. This is the la the map of languages in Mexico. And there's also a lot of Spanish, right? Spanish is spoken more. Yeah, another map. Okay. Mm. Okay. This is this is the the as I say the many languages, indigenous languages in in Central America. And, and, and America and South America. So we have Quechua, Guarani, Aymara, Nahual, the Mayan languages and the Mapuche in Chile. Uh, so there's still languages that are spoken. It's beautiful to know that. It's beautiful that we still keep, you know, the we, and now this is the, the migration of the black population, right? Um, and it has also uh, uh, numbers and percentages. Uh, so um, Brazil is the second biggest um, country with black people in the world. So it's the second one. There is a lot in the Dominican Republic, in IT, in Colombia, we have close to um, 10 million uh, black in the United States, 41 million, you see, but Brazil is 85 million. So another one. Okay, so these are the, the, those languages, the million of people that speak it, the Nahual, the Quechua, the Guarani, the Aymara, the Maya, and the Mapuche. You see, it's incredible to think that uh, close to 2 million people speak Nahual, and Quechua. And for example, here in Northampton, Massachusetts, you find an Ecuadorian population that speaks Quechua, they, and they uh, have services in Quechua, religious services in Quechua. You know, it's interesting to, to see that happening here. And they, they are Ecuadorians that most of them are undocumented, so. And now these are the these are the Andean countries. You see the ones in 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 blue, and the ones in uh, that color, brick color. Those are the Andean países andinos. 
Those are the Andean countries. Okay, another one. So, so um, this is the story. We don't have to go through that, but this is, I teach the story of the colonial era in America Latina, the social structure, what the Catholic Church did, and what the mission, the missioneros, the missioners um, did, because they all divided the whole new world uh, under them. Okay, another one? Is, do we have time? Um, we should probably, well, we've got a, a few more minutes and then we can, we should probably break. Okay, this is very important to, to say that the legacy of colonialism, uh, Portuguese as much as Spaniard, influences our identity, our cultural identity to today because the ideological base was is, uh, una misión civilizadora, right? A civilized mission, paternalist, that, uh, that consider the other, the Indian, the black as inferior. And in that way, they justify the military conquest, the political dominion, the exploitation of the land, and the exploitation of their inhabitants. And then it was to get, it went together with the, the, the Christianizing and the repression of all the, 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 the religions called paganas, pagans, um, and also the dominion and the introduction of, of the Spanish language and of the Portuguese language. So that is the base of colonialism. Um, what we learn, once we go through this history, then we learn what is it that is still today we, uh, we as, as, as prejudice and as isms, we carry and we have kind of digest from, from the colonial times. And that's when all kinds of things come, all kinds of stories about prejudices that are in the language, that are in, at the personal level, that are at the, at the interpersonal level, and also as the institution. So we deal with that, we study that, we talk about it, it comes out, and then, and then, and then I use visions because it's easy to, to guide um, the different behaviors uh, from both those who are whiter and they are, um, they consider themselves like a Spaniards all, all, almost, and with those that have internal, internalized oppression. So that was done there. And then at the end, at the end of the second day, then I introduced the, um, what the beloved community, um, uh, you know, the program of the Episcopal Church, uh, not calling it becoming beloved community because we, we feel that we are beloved. We are a beloved community. And by understanding and working on this path that the Episcopal Church has suggested on the personal level, on the spiritual level, uh, then we will continue uh, being the beloved community in a different way, reconciling, healing from, from telling the truth, dreaming, and repairing for all those, um, all those harms that we inherited, that we went through, and that we inherited from our colonial times. So, and I think we can do this here in this country with the different communities uh, and then use uh, and then expand it and do what is it that, what is it that we have to heal from mistreating or not understanding or having prejudice against African-Americans, Asians, Native Americans and Asians. So that is my dream and I, I'm going to do it. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's my birthday today. I'm 74. 
I, I have probably six more years of clarity in my head. I hope God gives it to me. We'll do it. And I invite anybody who is a Latino listening to join into this group. We have to find funding to do it, but, uh, but we, have, we can do it. Si se puede. All right. <laughs> Thank right, you. So I, I think this is probably a good place to, to break. And, and uh, I, I don't see much conversation at the chat room, um, although I'm seeing a couple of things popping up here. Um, and I just want to just see if I can talk through a couple of things here. And, and, and first of all, you know, th thank you, Emma, for that, that great history right. uh, lesson and, uh, you know, the context for where folks are coming from, their experiences, and, and, and what you're seeing as you, you talk with, the, with folks and, and what, what you're doing to engage them. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of your thoughts about um, dealing with parishes here in our diocese in New England that are, are, are mixed versus those that are, um, are more homogeneous. Have you, I'm just curious what your thoughts are and how people who have to, to deal with that more heterogeneous parishes, what would you say to them in, in, well, uh, uh -huh. in the approach to, to, to uh, working with, with uh, Latinos in those parishes? Right. I mean, my experience is mainly with Massachusetts, but we are always, we have, we, uh, Latino Hispanic ministries have been always invited to be part of a larger um, Anglo church. Uh, and sometimes without doing the proper discernment. And sometimes we are invited because the church is getting smaller and maybe they think that with, with, a, with bigger, with, with, a, with the numbers that we are, maybe they'll, they'll save themselves. Um, and the work that has to be done, uh, and I see it in almost uh, all those five ministries that we have in the Diocese of Massachusetts, is to put them together, to, to get them to know each other, probably by telling the stories or, or learning, about, learning about their histories. Um, it, I know it's very painful for, I know it, I know it in my heart that it must be very painful for a conscious white American to, to share the history of this country, because the history of this country is complex. Uh, it is very sad, uh, but it has to be done because the truth has to come out. Uh, so I think that if we would get along better, we would be, I don't know, like more, more, more like in harmony if we did this kind of work um together right this is this is our history this is our history why is it that we're here because you know um we are more and more welcoming uh undocumented uh we we would like to have plenty of money to make them sanctuary churches those churches um but that work hasn't been done yet and i think it should be done uh even in, even i have suggested it where i am placed as a deacon with the lutherans because i work with the latinos and and they're growing and i think that sometimes when we grow too much and the 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 anglo population is still small and it's smaller i guess it's smaller so there is a lot of worry and and they don't have to worry about us. We love them, but then we have to come together and really um, heal from both harms, you know? Heal, reconcile, and, you know, and be together, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think as, as some discussion is taking place uh, in the chat about uh, the fact that uh, people don't even know that they're doing and, see, and saying racist things. And, and 
behaving in a racist fashion. And um, I think it, it's, that speaks to the need to, as you were saying, just bring people together and tell stories. Yes. Um, yes, because the first thing that I did in, in Panama was that they have to tell each other's story. And they kept doing it. They kept doing it. It kept coming. Everything was at the personal level because those women have to go, they, they had to go to their diocese and say, we want to do this work in this diocese, you know? So they have to. And I think also that's the nature of the beast when we're talking about um, dealing with uh, difference is that many people don't know. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. And that's part of, like you say, Emma, um, coming together and telling the story. Because yeah. if you don't encounter people, then you don't have yeah. a sense of the, the distance between. Right, right, right. Yeah, I tell you a story that really transformed me. When I was taking, when I was being trained in kaleidoscope, there is an exercise that is wonderful because they give you pictures and then you can tell a moment when you have been, uh, you know, wounded by racism. And there were uh, Americans and there were Latinos. The Latinos were in the middle of this. In, there were two circles. The small circle was Latino and the big circle was American. And you know, everybody, <laughs> For me, I thought at that time, no, 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 no. I mean, white Americans are perfect. Everything is fine. They're the happiest people. They know how to do it. They know how to solve problems. When I heard the stories coming from them, I said, oh, my God, we all suffer from the same thing. You know, they have been discriminated. They have been hurt. So that changed my attitude. And I said, we are all, we have a lot in common that we don't even know. We do have a lot in common and we can be together. I do believe that. If I didn't believe that, I, I couldn't do this work. You know? I, I think that the church is uniquely positioned to bring those people together. Right. Um, and, and what I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing is those stories about how we can bring people together. Right, right. Um, yeah, 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 right. That's true. Well, that has to be done, you know. Uh, uh, so I'm just looking at the chat and uh, Jane is uh, making the comment about um, uh, the attitude of uh, let's invite Hispanic Latinos into our church, uh, which is valid up only valid only up to a point and I think this is a, a real a real topic that uh, we have to discuss and and think about because um, there are so many people who think well we just need to get them into our church no the them is the <laughs> other and then everything would be okay and no. and that's uh, from my perspective that's not no. necessarily going to work and no. you know you, you you hear the the conversation about you know, Malcolm X really was the first to say it, and Martin Luther King took it up. Sunday morning at 10 a.m. is the most segregated hour of the week. Yes. And, uh -huh. and I think it was Martin the, Luther King said that, yeah. And, yeah. you know, it, that's used as a, almost as saying that's bad. Yeah. And I'm not so sure that's bad. Yeah. Um, you know, and the analogy that I use is... Um, where we we are we have families we have a, a mother a father a sister a brother and and oh. siblings yeah and um there's time when the family needs to be together yeah uh -huh. and would you ask a mother to go someplace separate from the father on sunday no <laughs> no so i think this is a well, there is a lot there is a lot i mean we've been trying where I am in, in East Boston, the Latinos that are bigger in group on Sundays are asking the, the pastors, these are Lutheran pastors, we want more bilingual uh, services and we want somehow that sermon in Spanish. Uh, and it has been quite a struggle because Communities that have been 
worshiping for the longest, longest, and absolutely love their music and the liturgy and the way they are used to. It is it's going to take a long time, and it's going to take an opening of their hearts to give up and to let the others come in with their own culture, their own language. And so what we're doing right now in, in East Boston is that the, in order to have a ceremony in English and a ceremony in Spanish, we go down to the basement and hear the ceremony in, in Spanish, which is, which is important uh, because for Latinos, the ceremony is very important. That message is very important and it's working out. So, but, but still, you know, the, there is still the, 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 a little bit of complaint about, but those songs we don't know. <laughs> you know, that, that, that to me though is, is getting to know one another. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, and it's, it's a lot, I mean, it's a work of love. It's a work that it has to be done. Otherwise, um, because the places where I've seen Latinos thrive is the places where they are alone. Their church is their church. This is they, there is something about ownership because I always say we don't. It takes us such a long time to own something here, but if they own a church, it's unbelievable. Because I've been giving lectures in places so the only people are Latinos and they have my God all kinds of ministries. I mean, but so the other the other one when we are invited, it takes a long time. And what is happening also is that the white population is getting older and smaller and smaller, and the Latino population, like in Lawrence, is over 100, and the English population. But what is happening, I'll tell you what is happening there. The, the young people that are bilingual, they like to go to the English services. Mm -hmm. So they will never be able to get rid of the English service, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you yeah, know, and, and, and Jane, wanted me to, to make sure we also brought up the, the sense that we are, we are the church. Everyone is the church. Oh yeah. And, and uh, I think that's actually a challenge for some people to realize that right. everyone is the church. <laughs> right. um, so we need to, and this, this to me comes back to uh, as our PB, our presiding bishop keeps saying, we are, we are together yeah. the Jesus movement, right. not just, the, the European Americans, not just the right. Latinos, not just the African Americans. We all are the church. We all are the Jesus movement. Right. Um, right. And the question is, how do we get everyone to to think that? Right. When we live and operate in our own spheres of yes. influence. I think. I think. Um, I, I I suggested your diversity dinners to the to the Lutheran pastors. Mm -hmm. We did it uh, because on, on we're doing lunches. Some of them come, some some of the Anglos don't come. But for example, we've been doing it we've been doing it for two years. The um, the um, you know the coming together and sharing food and talking about it. Uh, the first time more came the last time and we do it on on holy thursday monday thursday and the last year i think two of them came so it didn't work so we have to do more more work it takes a long time these are older people that are used to their ways and and they don't see it they loved us they are there i mean they are generous and everything but togetherness is harder mm -hmm. I think, you know, I um, I struggle with the idea that that saying about the most segregated time of the week, because I think I think people do need their spaces. And I think that that was more a commentary on the illusion that church is some rarefied um, place where all of a sudden we come together in a, you know, blessed Christian community. And in reality... Um, it's one of our biggest silos, not that it has to change in, you know, ultimately. And um, it is a place where people are challenged to create um, a different 
way of being together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, I'm seeing some comments about um, to, that um, it's the Java who said it was a job of Christianity to disturb the comfortable and the comfort the disturbed, afflict the comfort the afflicted and fl afflict the comfortable. Um, and the chat just disappeared. And then I saw a comment that um, seemed to agree with it, but the chat's disappeared now. <laughs> I'm seeing you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something's changed. Change, but not, oh, here, let me see what this, there was another comment that, um, it was Emily that um, talked about the, the worship at general convention. There is something unique about it. I mean, because there is such diversity in the music and the people and the style of worship. Oh, yeah. And so that is a unique uh, opportunity. Oh, yeah. So I don't know. Did we lose our host? I think so. I don't know. I don't see anything. I see myself huge. <laughs> yeah. So um, we are at the end of our time. Okay. I don't know if um, others want to make some um, few last comments. So, Emma, do you have any last words for the um, group? Uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation for your presentation and all the information that you presented. Um, I have been intrigued by just looking at the various language groups and Isn't just that also, <laughs> yes, and looking at, um, you know, the that map where you showed that United States and we say not, Brazil is the largest um, demographic and then the United States comes in there close behind. Yeah. And so some of that is eye-opening things that I have not thought about before. Right, 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 right. Uh -huh. No, no, what I think, I think what we need is um, people to support this work because it's bigger. I mean, I just gave you a glimpse of it, but it is fascinating. It's, it, for me, is is one of my commitments as a, uh, as, as a Latina and with the Latino communities that I love so much. My work is being in, in doing all kinds of things uh, to empower them because um, they have so much wisdom, they have so much desire to learn, to... to... I want to see them at the general convention. I want to see them uh, in, in the diocese, in all those commissions. I want to see them somewhere. We have to um, be, represent, Latinos have to be, have to be in, in our diocese and not only uh, you know, in, in our ministries in far away. So um, I need people who work with me because I've been doing this by myself. So supported by um, the missioner, the Latino missioner, Anthony Guillen, but, mm -hmm. but by myself. So anybody who wants to work with me <laughs> is welcome. So I see James has re, and I was just about to close us, James. Um, can you hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Did I come back just in time? You came back <laughs> just in time. <laughs> Sorry about that. My computer died on me. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, so I think, in the, just in closing, just want to thank Emma for, for this wonderful presentation, this wonderful uh, history and background on uh, Latino uh, Americans and and, uh, and and culture and and how it's expressing itself here in uh, in Province One and in some 
thoughts as to how to deal with it um, in, in our province. And with that, I don't know, Karen, did you do a closing prayer? <laughs> I was just about to. Oh, please. <laughs> Lord, it is night. The night is for stillness. Let us be still in the presence of God. It is night after a long day. What has been done has been done. What has not been done has not been done. Mm -hmm. Let it be. The night is dark. Let our fears of the darkness of the world and our own lives rest in you. The night is quiet. Let the quietness of your peace enfold us, all dear to us, and all who have no peace. The night heralds the dawn. Let us look expectantly to a new day, new joys, new possibilities. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so guys, see you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. And um, we'll see you hopefully next month at our next webcast, where I believe the topic is going to be uh, sanctuaries. Oh, wow. Beautiful. I'll be looking forward to it. Great. Okay, bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye, James. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Emma, I think, will, will you stay for a minute? Emma? Emma? Okay, okay. Emma? Yes, I'm here. Emma? I'm here. Okay. Okay. Can we unmute Jane? Okay. I guess you have to unmute her. Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, and Do you want me I to actually, leave? No, I no. Oh. I was saying to unmute you. Oh, I, I unmuted myself. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me do this too. Uh, I think Matt's still here. Matt's yeah. still here. I'm here. Yeah. I'm seeing very little, but I'm here. Because I was closing and then I opened it up again. Yeah, that's, that's uh, my fine. My computer also died on me in the middle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm trying to get back to log in as the host because I am logged in as a <laughs> as a, a normal uh, um, participant so I can't do things like turn off the recording <laughs> when I'm not logged in as the host. Uh, Will you have to get out and get in again? Oh, no I because then he has to have send a new invitation. Oh. Well, um, I may have to because otherwise I, I'm not the um, host, so I don't have the host's controls. Oh. So what do you have to say? So um, I guess we can just go oh. ahead and take it now. Um, and I'll, I'll just. So we I'll usually do a debrief. What? Debrief? Yeah, so we just do a, a, a little debrief. So we just. We debrief, yes. Um, as a team, and I, I think it went, I think it went well. I think you, you know, uh, Emma, you covered a lot of material. <laughs> uh, <laughs> slides. So how um, did you feel about it? <laughs> I was what? talking to Emma. Oh no, I know this by heart. So I mean, yeah. it was in English. I do it in Spanish. I mean, this is the first time that I do it in English. So. But I feel fine. Second time. Second time you got it. was the second time you got it in English. Yeah, because I went to your class. <laughs> I know. So um, I wish I knew more about what's going on in Connecticut. The, all the other, you know, uh, diocese. Um, maybe at one point next year, we can do it with other people, you know? So, because they're, I'm sure they're doing different. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Well, that that would be the one thing that it would be nice to be able to have is someone yeah. who's been on the ground doing. Yeah. The work. Yeah. And, was, yeah. That and, would have been interesting, but I I only know from Latinos I know the deans, the dean of the Western Massachusetts, the dean of, I mean, Miguelina in Connecticut. So I don't know, I mean, that's, 
I don't know whether they're doing any anti-racism work in Maine or Vermont or I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't think there's much, if, no. if I, at least not in the Episcopal Church. I mean, I know people who are outside of the Episcopal Church doing this work. Or the yeah, they're doing this work. But they, so I don't, I don't know if it was not. So by next year, if we, if I get the funding to create something, um, you know, based on this, on, 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 on our own history and how it happened, then maybe we'll have more people in a presentation, in a formal presentation, you know? Um, so, um, you know, what is a critical, um, but, so they're looking at diversity in other ways. I think that their diversity, you know, maybe Native American, but but is mainly in their urban areas, and their urban areas are spread apart. Mm. I'm wondering whether, as one of the follow-ups, because this felt like a good. It's like a number of the things we've done where we got started and we're hungry for more. Right, um, right. And I'm I'm wondering whether. Um, something that was, as somebody just suggested, kind of, uh, stories from on the ground of ways that Latino congregations and mixed congregations are being church in our province. Um, because there's different ways that people are being church together. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and yep. so it would be really good to hear that because it would also put front and center um, communities of Latinos being church as opposed to let's invite people in to our Anglo thing. One of the things in, that happened in, in North Carolina when I was there is we were talking about um, African American and white parishes that had merged for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. and there was always a cultural and racial loss for the black parish. Right. Um, you know, because it would end up being subsumed. Uh, it didn't happen for everybody, but in the majority it did. And so there were ways of being church that were lost as well. Right. Um, yeah, the traditions, inevitably, when you try to merge, something yes. has to get given up. Right. And often and because is, there's a history. The biggest, I'm sorry, that, go ahead. That, is, that is the biggest fear. Um, that's a fear and a pain, you know. I mean, yeah. and I think, you know, as, as I went to the new community conference, it was such, it was so interesting seeing how the ecumenical service, for example, they, people were able to combine traditions from the various cultures. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's, there's, as we've been saying, there's a time for heterogeneousness and a time for homogeneousness. Okay. Well, that's what would be interesting to have like a little panel or something, you know, say uh, a mostly Latino congregation um, talking about their, how they're doing church and then a mixed congregation, including talking about their struggles. Mm -hmm. That could be. You know, that'd be really wonderful if, um, you know, it can be next year or whatever, but I, I think it would now that we have that basis, um, it would just be good to see how it's working itself out, you know, and and also really stress the being church. Mm -hmm. I keep saying this, but it, it, it drives me kind of crazy when it's, you know, I wish we had more whatever, let's pull them in. Oh, and that's, yeah. that's disrespectful in a way, you know? Yeah, that's racist in a way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not respectful. Um, and, you know, the the interesting thing in, in East Boston is that we have homeless come to this church and alcoholics. And it's even harder because we're talking about a population that right. you're not expected to see it in a church. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I think this is, this is good. Um, as, as Jane said. I'm we, glad I was able to do it. Yeah, thank, thank you so, so much, and on your birthday, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. Right. And I want to, I want, I want you guys to pray for me because at the end of um, 
of April, I'm going to do something similar uh, in the Dominican Republic. And it's going to be more complex because, oh, wow. you know, <laughs> the, the problems there are bigger than in any other country with the Haitians and the Dominicans and the way they acted, taking away their citizenship and things like that. So it's going to be interesting to see that. You know, but I need prayer because I, I want to prepare something along the way, but you know, related to the, that country. So, so I want you to know that you got birthday wishes from folks at one thirty-eight. Somebody was on there. <laughs> Who was there? So, I was trying to remember. We were it, we were on our Facebook, and somebody said, "Oh, it's Emma's birthday." <laughs> And so I said, oh, well, I'm going to see her later. I wish her happy birthday and promptly thank forgot. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm 74. Yay! <laughs> 74 years young. Yeah. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Right. A lot of years. <laughs> thank okay. you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening. And thank you for the prayer so that if this happens. It has to happen, okay? It will. It Thank will. You. Thank you. All right, signing off. Have All right. Bye-bye. 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 Oh, look at this. <laughs>